today is a very different city to the one it was 20 years ago. For one thing, it's considered to be much safer. There's been a big drop in violent crime since the 1990s. It's a phenomenon often credited to the tough policies of this man, former mayor Rudy Giuliani. He may have done wonders in the Big Apple, but oddly enough, as the rate of violent crime plunged in New York, it also plummeted in Los Angeles, Atlanta, Chicago, in fact, all over the United States and in many other countries. Well, there was this compelling increase in crime rates from 1960 to 1990. The rate of violent crime in the United States uh, quadrupled over this period. And right around the early to mid-1990s, the violent crime rate began to tumble. And it fell suddenly, rapidly, and unexpectedly. Among all the possible explanations came a seemingly absurd proposition that the late 20th century crime wave was not so much a factor of changing economics, drug use or police tactics, but the mass scale exposure of young children to one specific element, lead. From leaded petrol emissions. It makes sense, and indeed we've undertaken similar studies in Australia which show a very strong relationship between lead in air and uh, crime 20, 22 years later. Although it's just a correlation, studies of individuals also show high childhood lead exposure increases the likelihood of a life marked by crime. Lead plays no useful role in the body. Even at low levels, it's associated with lower IQ, decreased memory, behavioral problems, and increased risk of juvenile delinquency and criminality. Despite a massive drop in lead emissions, childhood lead exposure remains a problem in some parts of Australia. Floating in the dust of our mining towns, settled in the soils of our inner city gardens and peeling off our old Australian homes, lead lives on. Because it can be modified, we should modify it and remove that as a detrimental effect on the outcomes of children. Gasoline is the fuel that powers this modern age. Perhaps the biggest crime associated with lead is that it was known to have serious toxic effects long before it was added to petrol. The Romans knew that it was a problem. They used to use lead in wine, and they knew that it was a toxin. Perhaps more pertinently, we've known since the 19th century that lead in dust, and also at the turn of the 20th century, that lead in paint was a problem for children. We had lots of information. There were lots of research reports. There were lots of medical reports that showed that lead was a toxic substance and caused serious neurological damage and, in some cases, death. In fuel, it was thought to be dilute enough not to matter. But decades later, mounting evidence showed that even low levels of lead exposure could cause a drop in children's IQ. Lead in petrol and paints were slowly phased out. But by then, much damage had already been done. Associate Professor Sami Zarin's study was one of a number of recent epidemiological studies which found strong correlations between lead emissions and violent crime rates. But what was intriguing about his study was he compared six very different US cities. San Diego, New Orleans, Atlanta, Minneapolis, Chicago and Indianapolis. So the cities were very different in terms of their demographic structure. They were different in terms of their income levels. They were different in terms of the metric tons of PB emitted and in terms of the aggravated assault rates. When aggravated assault rates were plotted over time and compared to rising and falling lead emissions, the results were startling. They had very similar looking shapes in the sense that they both rose and declined but they were separated by a mysterious 22-year period. And so the logic was that we had groups of children exposed to varying rates of lead graduating 
into the age crime curve. Most convincingly, the rates at which the violent crime dropped matched the speed at which those cities phased out leaded petrol. So in cities where the phase out was steeper, the drop in the aggravated assault rate was steeper. Correlation doesn't prove anything, and there is much scepticism surrounding the idea that violent crime waves are caused by lead exposure. But in a yet-to-be-published Australian study, Professor Mark Taylor has found a similar correlation between peak lead emissions and peak violence, and not just in big cities. We've looked at Bullaroo, for example, which was a smelting town. They've closed the smelter now. We've looked at suburbs in Sydney, and we've also looked at uh, Port Campbell. So they're a mixture of sources, smelting and also lead coming from gasoline. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's lead in air. For each of the seven towns he looked at, peak violence comes around 20 years after peak lead in air. The strongest correlation was seen in Earlwood in southwest Sydney. Earlwood uh, was a site where there's no smelter activity, it's leaded petrol emissions. It's exactly what we've seen in the United States. There's a peak in crime and the correlation is reliable across various places in New South Wales. As the world's biggest exporter of lead, Australia has done very well from this precious metal. Here in Broken Hill, the lead and silver ore body has kept the town alive. But in the red dust, the levels of lead are recognised as a constant invisible menace to members of the community, especially the young ones. They're still crushing and producing really fine or some of that's escaping, and that is being deposited in and around uh, Broken Hill. You can see on the house across the road, there's quite a lot of accumulated dust yeah, on, the, dust. Uh, on the boards. And indeed, when you start to look at sort of little nooks and crannies, you can see the dust that's accumulated over time. So in here, for example, you can see uh, the dust, and indeed... Yeah. It's very fine. Extremely fine. And it's this sort of dust that blankets the city, blankets gardens, play schools, playgrounds, etc. And you can see some of the minerals sparkling there on my finger. Mark's dust monitoring in the playgrounds of Broken Hill shows that a fine layer of lead dust contaminates the surfaces daily. So we did a, a study where we played on the playgrounds for 10 minutes and we wiped the hands after play. Within 10 minutes, the concentration of lead and other metals on the hands significantly exceeded, in most cases, safe benchmarks. The town is very aware of its lead risks, and children are monitored by the health centres regularly. If you could just fill out the lead consent form for me. But despite efforts to reduce lead exposure, a fifth of the town's children have a blood lead level over the current Australian benchmark of 10 micrograms a decilitre. So we're just going to wipe your hand again, sweetie. It's at this level Australian medical authorities recommend investigating the source of lead exposure. But it's widely recognised that there is no safe level. Indeed, the natural level of lead in pre-industrial humans is 0.016 micrograms per decilitre. The current Australian goal, which is under review, is 10 micrograms per deciliter. That's 625 times the natural levels. The US have already lowered their level of concern to five. It's 5.7, so oh, that's, that's an excellent result. So well done to you and well done to you, Reese. That's a good job, buddy. We're collecting data in the, all of this primary school catchments. So we're trying to understand the relationship between atmospheric deposition and the risks to children's blood lead exposure. We're also focusing on areas where the known levels of elevated blood lead in children. Mother of three, Pam, has covered all dusty areas in her garden with layers of gravel, and the rest is lawn and pavement. Yet despite her best efforts, her son's lead level recently spiked to nine micrograms a decilitre. They've since come back down. I initially was uh, panicking and thought, what, what has happened for the lead level to increase. I don't know if we become a bit complacent with hand washing, but we couldn't really link anything to why it had 
children have a greater predisposition of hand-to-mouth behaviours. They eat soil, they put things in the mouth, and if those articles and toys, for example, are covered in lead dust, they will ingest it. And so in a leaded environment where there's lead dust on those articles or on the hands, it's really, really difficult to prevent that exposure, which is why it's very, very important to implement primary prevention to stop the lead escaping from sites before it gets onto homes and domestic residences and, and, and those types of places. Chad Hines grew up just a couple of hundred metres from Bullaroo's now demolished lead smelter. So this whole area was the lead smelter? The smelter was pretty much right here, all in that area there. I was always outside playing as a kid, in the dirt, always digging the dirt up. Had no idea of how toxic the dirt actually was. So we used to play all up in here, stacks of just blow all the stuff straight over here. His mum, Lynn, believes Chad would have led a very different life had she understood the risks. Chad used to sit in, in a playpen out on the front of um, the house. He was just totally taken in by it. You know, the Tonka trucks were over there. I usually had to walk with him over there and he just thought it was great. As we went to preschool, the teachers at preschool used to say, Chad's got a long way to catch up to the other kids. I never passed any of me tests, like, you know, how you end of year tests, and I wouldn't pass them, and I always had behaviour problems. I was always in trouble. Not, not being able to read, I'd get really scared when I had to read in class. The school, they were trying to say that, you know, there was no lead problem. Mum took me to get tested at the health clinic, which was in Bulleroo, and my lead level come back, and it was 29. If someone had walked down the road dressed as Mr Lead, you know, with um, lead falling out, it'd be fine, people would understand, but there was nothing like that. It was just... Um, it's invisible. It was it? just, yeah, Pazmenko saying, no problem. Of all the troubles Lynn's faced, the hardest to manage has been Chad's explosive temper. I get agitated really bad. I've got anger issues and... I've been in a lot of trouble with the police. ABOs, mum's put about six ABOs on me, I think. I had about four mates that have got the same problems as me. Yeah, we've been in trouble with the law, high lead levels, same thing. But every child is an individual. Can Chad really blame his run-ins with the law on lead poisoning? <laughs> Port Pirie study in South Australia is one of the longest running studies in the world on the developmental effects of elevated lead levels in children. Okay, now see these blocks? They're all alike. And some sides are red, some sides are white. These children grew up near the largest lead smelter in the world. A new review from the University of Adelaide found lead had a measurable but small impact on their lives compared to other factors. Children with higher blood lead levels um, were a little more likely to experience poorer cognitive and emotional and behavioural development. And also into adulthood, we did see, more so for females, the association between lead levels um, and uh, mental health difficulties. But these associations were small once we started um, adjusting for and considering other early childhood factors that may have also been influencing their development. Things like parents' socioeconomic status, um, their education levels, whether they were employed or not. One aspect the Port Pirie study didn't look for was an association between childhood lead exposure and violent crime. Port Pirie has never really been the focus for, for high crime levels or delinquency. Uh, so looking at Port Pirie, we, we definitely wouldn't be making any suggestions um, that, that lead exposure and, um, and delinquency are correlated. It's, it's definitely not anything we've seen. <laughs> But on the other side of the world, in the US state of Ohio, an even more comprehensive long-term lead study has looked at the association. We have the best measures of exposure on an individual level and the best measures of individual outcome of any lead study that has ever been conducted in the world. 
the Cincinnati lead study has been running for 35 years, but there's no smelter in this town. Here, the principal danger comes from run-down older housing. Lead paint residues, no question about it. When we started this study in 1979, there was actually a real debate and real question as to where lead exposure was coming from. We initially started with about 400 pregnant women and we specifically targeted areas of Cincinnati, Ohio where there has been historically a high incidence of lead poisoning going back to the 1950s where there was a pre-World War II housing and a high amount of lead dust we started in the first trimester of pregnancy and got a measure of lead in the mother's blood while she was pregnant. Then we got a measure of lead in the blood when the child was born. And then every three months until they were six and a half years of age, no other study in the world has ever done this. Professor Kim Dietrich followed the children all the way into adulthood and saw significant and continuing effects from lead exposure, including lower IQs and behavioural and neurological problems, after adjusting for many other influencing factors. Their mothers and their girlfriends and, and their aunts and others would come to me and say things like, why can't my son hold on to a job? Why am I angry all the time? Why am I having problems maintaining a stable domestic relationship. And I looked at their lead exposure histories and what I found was, more often than not, is that they had high blood lead concentrations. And these blood lead concentrations were mostly found in individuals who had a history of criminal behavior, repeated incarcerations, domestic violence, and other issues. So what we did is we continued to follow these subjects into adulthood to see if this trend continued. What we found was very interesting. We found that those with the highest levels of lead exposure continue to engage in criminal activity. Not, ju not just during adolescence, but also it pushed them into an early adult criminal career which included uh, homicide, which was rare, but also assault, rape, those sorts of behaviors. The main problem with lead lies in its similarity to calcium, one of the main players in the brain. From birth to adulthood, lead can interfere with calcium's critical processes as billions of neurons grow and connect. MRI scans conducted in early adulthood reveal changes in the brain that may account for the association with violent crime. We found for brain volume that the higher their childhood blood lead level was, the smaller their brain was, particularly in the frontal cortex, the region of the brain that really makes us most human. It's our decision-making ability, our emotional control, our judgment, it's the part of the brain that's really essential for proper functioning. Most critically, the frontal cortex is the part of the brain that controls impulsivity, the anticipation of consequences and aggression. We found on the order of 2% volume loss, so a shrinkage of their brain. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale on disease, when we see a neurodegenerative disease, we see around 10% volume loss. So we're much smaller scale. These participants can live what's essentially a normal life, but the lead has done a damaging effect to them. They found reductions in certain brain chemicals and in the myelin sheath around the axon of neurons that helps messages travel faster. <laughs> When we did functional MRI, we did a verb generation task where we asked the participants to think of verbs when we would present them with a noun. And we could see that the regions of the brain responsible for language were damaged in a dose-dependent fashion. Language function focuses to the left hemisphere of the brain. But in the Cincinnati lead study, participants used 
both sides of their brain in the language task, an indication the brain is trying to compensate for damage. We saw effects in everyone. However, the greatest effect are in those who had higher mean childhood blood lead levels. The IQ scores from participants in the Cincinnati lead group were fed into a larger international study which determined the greatest fall in intelligence occurs in the lowest range of exposure. Children with a blood lead level up to 10 micrograms a deciliter lost an average of seven IQ points. Kim Dietrich doesn't consider this a small drop. Oh, I'd kill for seven IQ points. <laughs> No, no, seven IQ points is not small. It's, it's a big effect. It's worth pointing out that two decades ago, when leaded petrol was still being phased out, the average blood lead level of Australian children under five was over five micrograms a deciliter. Recent studies now put the average level under three. So the danger from lead in petrol has disappeared long ago, right? In terms of the legacy, those emissions have not gone away. About five million tonnes of lead have been emitted into the American environment from the tailpipes of uh, automotive vehicles. In Australia, it's about 235,000 tonnes. The lead does not go away. It resides in the soils and it also resides in the dust that permeates homes in the inner parts of Sydney, for example, or Melbourne or Brisbane. Mark's program, Veggie Safe, has been mapping how much of that lead is in Sydney gardens. So we'll just test this garden bed here where they're growing their veggies. Over 500 homes have been sampled. In some of the busiest parts of the city, he's found soil lead concentrations that rival those in Broken Hill. This home in Balmain is metres away from one of the busiest roads in Sydney. We're here to test the veggie patch. We're going to test the upper part of the soil, effectively the, uh, the top couple of centimetres. It's those particles that are likely to get onto the food plants. And also, it's the part of the soil which is most easily interacted with children. So we'll just put the XRF down on the soil. And the, uh, the lead in this soil is, has a reading of 202 milligrams per kilogram. That's quite good, isn't it? The, Standard for residential gardens in Australia is 300 milligrams per kilogram. The natural level of lead in soil in Sydney is between about 20 and 30 milligrams per kilogram. This veggie patch has been constructed with fresh brought in soil and it's okay. But it's the rest of the garden homeowner Angela's been worried about. Her hens, which peck and bathe in the dusty corners of the yard, haven't laid an egg in three months. We weren't completely naive to the idea that there could be some contaminated soil in this area. It's been a big industrial area in the past, it's just it's residential now. And we did what we could. We actually totally changed the layout of the garden. We brought in over seven tonnes of topsoil and sand. When Mark tested the soils, Angela got a nasty shock. The lowest level we had on our plot was 600 in the middle of the lawn. The chicken coop was over 900. Uh, the back of the garden was 1,500. The side of the house was uh, 2,500. And the front garden was 1,400. To put those figures into context, this chart shows the likely lead exposure of a two-year-old based on the soil lead levels in their environment. At just over 1,000 milligrams a kilogram, the blood lead level is likely to cross the 10 microgram mark. There's many areas in Sydney where readings are over 1,000 milligrams a kilogram, and most of these are close to busy highways. The pattern that we see in Sydney of higher soil lead levels in the inner parts of the city and less in the outer parts is replicated all over the world. New York, Paris, all the cities in London, it's classic, and the levels are rather similar wherever you go. Although Angela remediated her soils, there's potential contamination from a nearby construction site, which has been stirring up a lot of old dust. And the house is old and has peeling paint. It contains around 4% lead. I think this is one of the things that we've realised when we've been doing this work, that people have forgotten really about the risk of lead in paint. And I've been to houses before and spoken to the parents of children where they've inadvertently contaminated the house and 
raise the blood lead levels of children by sanding old paint, which is quite rich in lead. It can be up to 50% lead. That generates billions of small particles that permeate the house. With all the recent studies showing low levels of exposure can be harmful, the current Australian guideline of 10 micrograms a decilitre is under review. It's likely to be lowered to five sometime this year. From his calculations, Mark Taylor estimates 100,000 Australian children could be over this reference value. So what can we do about it? If I was to apply the, the primary rule for public health, which is primary prevention, I would recommend that we go back and look at what's going on at the operations in these towns, Mount Isa, which blood lead levels appear to be falling, Broken Hill, Port Pirie, and look at what's going on on site and how can we reduce dust coming off that site. In terms of the decoration in your house, you have to call a professional decorator and get somebody in to remove that paint professionally or to seal it. If you're worried about exposure from other sources in your house, such as the paint and such as the soil, you can take those samples and you can get them tested at scientific laboratories. The view that I take is that all our children are the future for Australia. And I think we have a, we have a duty to protect those children from modifiable exposures that exist in the environment. And lead is a modifiable exposure, particularly in mining and smelting communities. There has been no real resolution to this problem. There, there has been a real resolution to the problem of atmospheric lead with the elimination of lead from gasoline. But children living in our inner cities have not been the benefactors of this reduction of lead and gasoline because they are still living in a world of lead in our inner cities. Although far from proven that lead emissions is the culprit behind violent crime waves in the developed world, it's troubling that a handful of countries still use leaded petrol, including Iraq and Afghanistan. And children in nations with less stringent mining and industrial rules are suffering severe developmental defects and in some cases death from high levels of lead exposure. Nigeria, where hundreds of infants have recently died as a result of lead exposure from artisanal gold mining. It is the most important, most dramatic, most significant environmental health disaster, and it does not seem to get any attention at all. For more on the Nigerian lead crisis, visit the Catalyst website, where you'll also find information on how to test your home for lead and background on the studies mentioned in this program.